Hello all my truth seekers, welcome to the truth show. In this video I will discuss the darkness of the Bible, the verses that are left out of preacher's mouth. So yes, please note that this is all alleged. I've never met any of these people. I've deeply researched all of my information. This is a trigger warning. In this video, I may be talking about or showing sensitive material about some subjects or topics that may be disturbing or upsetting or may bring forth some troubling memories, as you read in the description or title. With that said, either end the video now or brace yourself. Aside from that, remember, this isn't to stray you away from the Bible. It's for you to see the Bible as a whole and not nitpick verses, but take verses in their entirety. Because believers and readers of the Bible should understand that some of the Bible were stolen, oh yes, from Africa. Teachings and various beliefs and put together by men to ensure women remain a man's shadow. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And men from that point on became seniority and rulers. This new sick, misogynist, egotistical, and bigot craze became the rise after the death of Cleopatra. Think about it. Whom the Romans hated. The new Greeks became Caucasian, and salvation wasn't only through women, but also through men, mostly men. The lies and the brainwashing began. Fast forwarding to now, the Bible was put together by slave owners, murderers, rapists, investors, and racist men. Yes, only men, but replaced by sexist men. They replaced Horus with Jesus, and then made him Caucasian, and then took father, son, and mother and flipped it to say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Do you see where I'm going with this? Women were purposely left out. It doesn't stop there. They then condone slavery. Jesus never spoke of slavery in a negative way either. For example, God is depicted as both approving and somewhat regulating slavery, ensuring that the traffic and ownership of fellow human beings proceed in an acceptable manner, so to speak. Passages referencing and condoning slavery are common in the Old Testament. In one place it read, and this was in Exodus 21st chapter, 20th through the 21st verse. When a slave owner strikes a male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, there is no punishment, for the slave is the owner's property. Oh, yes. So, the immediate killing of a slave is punishable but a man may so grievously injure a slave that they die a few days later from their wounds without facing any punishment or retribution oh yeah so this was pretty much condoned in all society especially in the middle east because at this time it condoned some form of slavery so it shouldn't be surprising to find approval for it in the bible as a human law punishment for the slave owner would be commendable. There was nothing quite so advanced anywhere in the Middle East. But as the will of a loving God, it appears less than admirable. More proof of the Bible was written by men and not divine? Well, let's move forward. The King James Version of the Bible presents the verse in an altered form, replacing slave with servant. Similarly misleading Christians as to the intentions and desires of their God. In fact, though the slaves of that time were mostly bond servants, and the Bible explicitly condemns the type of slave trade that flourished in the American South. I mean, this is what was said in Exodus 21st chapter and 16 verse. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. Oh, I'm not done yet, because the greed and evil has continued. You see, they needed to be respected and feel above the rest. So why not put in the Bible that many idolize and follow dedicatedly? Listen to this. This is in the New Testament. Oh yes, New Testament views on slavery. 
Yeah, this is the New Test Testament views on slavery. Says most of you are going to say, "Oh, I said the Old Testament." No, New Testament talks about it as well. Mm -hmm. The New Testament also gave slave supporting Christians fuel for the argument. Jesus never disapproved of human enslaving, and many statements attributed to him suggest a tactic acceptance or even approval of that inhuman institution. Throughout the Gospels, we read passages like. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above master. That was in Matthew 10, chapter 24, verse. Who then is the faithful and wise slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give the other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. That was in Matthew 24, chapter 45 to the 46th verse. You see, although Jesus used slavery to illustrate larger points, the question remains why he would directly acknowledge the existence of slavery without saying anything negative about it. The letters, however, moving on here, to attribute Paul also seem to suggest that the existence of slavery was acceptable and that slaves themselves should not presume to take the idea of freedom and equality preach by Jesus too far by attempting to escape their force servitude as it says in 1st Timothy 6 chapter 1st through the 5th verse it says let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be blasphemed yes blasphemed it says those who have Believing masters must not be disrespectful to them on the ground that they are members of the church. Rather, they must serve them all the more since those who benefit by the service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these duties. Yes. So they were saying, you believe in the church and God. You are members of the church. So you probably more than likely get treated better. You see how they make in our people believe in their format of God. Yes, starting to get revealed more and more. But you know what? Oh, they were really trying to push this Christianity. I mean, they were really trying to push Christianity. I mean, to a fault. It's ridiculous. By any means necessary. Oh, yes. It says Ephesians 6, chapter 5 through the 6th verse. It says, Slave, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling in the singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So you are slaves of Christ. So you have to do the will from God. So you do the work, but you're doing it for God, not for the slave owners, but the for God. So they wanted to make the slaves see them as gods. You honor us. You honor us, you honor God. Yes. That's what they were saying. And also says that says this about slaves in, the, in Titus, second chapter, ninth through the tenth verse. Tell slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every respect. They are not to talk back, not to pilfer, but to show complete perfect fidelity. So that in everything they may be an ornament to the doctrine of God our Savior. So they were saying, respect your slave owner. Don't talk back. Respect them. Honor them. Bow down to them because they are masters in God's work. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm not even done yet. Oh, and this verse in 1 Peter 2nd chapter 18 through the 29th verse is sick. And it's clearly blatant that it wasn't written by anyone divine. Here's what it says. Slaves accept the authority of your masters with all deference. Not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. Okay, so they said you get God's approval. You get God's approval. Only when you endure pain and you are good. Unfreaking believable. So accept pain, whether good or bad, but mainly when you're good because it's God's approval. 
That's the only way you get God's approval is if you allow them to beat you when you're good. That means you get God approval. It can beat you anytime they want. You don't have to do anything wrong, but by you enduring this pain, you get God's approval. This is sick. So it's not difficult to see how slave owning Christians in the South might conclude that the authors did not disapprove of this institution of slavery and probably regard it as an appropriate part of society. And if those Christians believe these biblical passages were divinely inspired, they would by extension conclude that alleged God's attitude towards slavery was not particularly negative because Christians were not prohibited from owning slave. There was no conflict between Christians and being a owner of human beings and what they do to them. So that was never an argument. That was never even a debate. It was just human right. You see, in early Christian history, there was almost universal approval of slavery among early Christian church leaders. Christians vigorously defended slavery along with other forms of extreme social stratification, meaning the arrangement, classification, or ranks between different people of social classes. They saw this as an institution by God and an integral part of natural order of men. Oh yes, well, I'm still not done yet. Because St. John Christosom said this, the slave should be resigned to his lot. In obeying his master, he obeys God, you see. See, yeah, uh-huh. So obeying your master, you obey God. Because your master is like God. These attitudes continue throughout European history and the world. Even as the institution of slavery evolved and slaves became servants, a little better than slaves, and living in deplorable situation that the church declared as being divinely ordered. Yes, Christianity started acting like they were the bridge and the salvation to heaven. Obey me and my orders, you will go to heaven. Nothing should stand in the way of the gods and goddesses. Remember that, people. Nothing should stand in the way of gods and goddesses. Nothing. What the church was saying they were, women were in that equation. I mean, not even after the poor labor of slaves disappeared, whereas full-fledged slavery thinking once again reared its ugly head, you see. And the thought of inhumane treatment of slavery being condemned wasn't going well for Christian leaders. They didn't like that. No, they did not such as Edmund Gibson, a delegate bishop in London, whom it made it clear, he made this clear, during the 18th century that Christianity freed people from the slavery of sin, not from earthly and physical slavery though. Here's what this so-called Christian said. The freedom which Christianity gives is a freedom from the bondage of sin and Satan, and from the dominion of men's lust and passions and ordinate. Yes, and inordinate desires but as to their outward condition whatever that was before whether bond or free their being baptized and becoming christians makes no matter of change in it so they can get baptized become christian and they're you know made up jesus whatever and it still don't make a difference i mean who cares if slaves have been baptized and the made of christianity or in plagiarized from negro african christianity nothing changed you know what, I'm done with the slavery subject because the church is so transparent now and me being an empath and media, I'm starting to see and feel my ancestors' anger and pain flash before my eyes. Talking about if you died a few days later, there is no punishment for slave owners. <laughs> this is not written by divine. This is not written by the godly heavens or whoever they made up. This is written by men, humans. Let's move on. Let's talk about white superiority. Blacks inferiority to whites has long been white Protestants. Yes, superiority. Although whites are not found in the Bible, that hasn't stopped members of groups like Christian identity from using the Bible to prove that they are the chosen people or true Israelites. Christian identity is just a new kid on the block of white Protestant supremacy. The earliest such group was the infamous Ku Klux Klan, which was founded as a Christian organization and still sees itself as defending true Christianity. And considering everything I just read, I can see why they feel that way. I mean, their ancestors wrote the Bible. Especially in the KKK's earliest days of Klansmen, openly recruited in white churches, attracting members from all 
strats of society, including the clergy. Oh, yes, everybody was in it. However, as we know, as we all know, the true Israelites are Negro slash colored African people. That's been proven time and time and time again. Now let's get deep. You see, there are many verses in the Bible that glorifies rape too. Deuteronomy 22nd chapter 28 through the 29th verse reads, If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives of silver. And she shall become his wife because he has violated her. He cannot divorce her all his days. Meaning, there's no sin in the man if he marries the girl he rapes. Screw age or if the girl is even attracted to him. If he wants her, just rape her. And pay the father and you shall have her. Oh yeah, I'm not done yet. There's more. In uh, Judges 20th chapter 4 through the 5th verse. The leaders of all the people, the tribes of Israel, took their places in the assembly of God's people. 400,000 men armed with swords. The Benjamite heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah and Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house intending to kill me. They raped my concubine and she said, I took my concubine, cut her into pieces and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now all you Israelites speak up and tell me what you have decided to. So in retrospect, nothing happened to these men who raped this woman, servant or peasant or concubine. Then to make it worse, she killed her peasant or servant or concubine and shipped her to the people who raped her. Yeah, I'm still not done yet. Because the Bible promotes killing substantially. I mean, it says in Genesis 38 chapter 24 verse, to kill all unmarried pregnant women. Then it says in 2 Samuel 12 chapter 14 verse, to kill infants of non-Christians. Yes, they were desperately trying to push Christianity by any means necessary. Then the hate and crusade continued because it said in 1 Peter 2 chapter 7 through the 8th verse, assisting gang rapes of young women. And then the so-called Christians killing in the Bible still was rapid because they said in Exodus 4 chapter 24 to the 25th verse, it was ordered to kill all uncircumcised males. Oh, and the push of Christianity continued, whereas they said in Deuteronomy 13, chapter 13 through the 19 verse, to kill our residents of any city home to a non-Christian. Now, let's not forget what it says to anyone who ignores the Old Testament in Matthew 5, chapter 15 through the 19 verse. Excommunicate those who ignore the Old Testament. Since you guys are saying, oh, this is the Old Testament. But it says in Matthew 5, chapter 15 through the 19 verse, and I say again, excommunicate those who ignore the Old Testament. You know what, I'm done. Because I think I proved my point time and time again. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you still think the entire Bible was written by divine or just by men? Tell me what you all think below.